All right, and in a short while, we're going to be chatting to a jewelry designer based in South Africa who is flying the flag high. So jewelry designer on the continent, uh, flying the flag high across the world. Now, a monastery in Lebanon is bringing together Christians once scattered by civil war. The 1975 to 1990 civil war may be over in Lebanon, but conflicts in nearby countries like Iraq and Syria have devastated entire communities where Christians once lived alongside Muslims. The civil war triggered an exodus among people of both the Christian and Muslim faiths, especially among minority sects like Brotos's Syriac Orthodox community, whose roots lie in early Christianity. Now for Samuel Botros, the last time he stepped into the Lebanese monastery of St. Anthony of Kozaya was in 1978. He was 24, newly married, and the country was in the grip of an all-out war. Like many of his generation, he left. It took him for 20 years to return. We were able to gather from seven countries, from our motherland, Lebanon, from Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Palestine and Iraq. They came from their countries so we can meet and gather. It has been a long time since we gathered. The first time since the 1950s that we had a meeting of Syriac Scouts community group. The monastery, which is nestled in a remote valley in the northern Lebanese mountains and dates from the 4th century, is a meeting place for Christians who have fled the conflict. Botros was visiting the monastery as part of a gathering of his community's scout group, their first in the region since the 1950s. The scout group's roughly 150 members include people living in Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, the Palestinian territories, and further afield. Botros says Lebanon was the only country where they could all meet easily and safely. Iraq, years of conflict most recently with Islamic State, erased much of the Christian heritage in ancient cities like Mosul and Sinjar in the north. In Syria's civil war, some of the oldest churches in Aleppo homes and other cities were damaged. Botros, now 65, is about to retire in Sweden, where he made his home years ago. He is father and grandfather to children who know Lebanon only through photos. It is the war that did this to us. It is the wars that continue to leave behind destruction and force people to leave from Lebanon, from Syria, from Iraq, even Palestine. People were displaced from all countries. On Sundays and public holidays, the monastery's small church with a bell tower and facade etched into the cliffs is full of people huddled in the pews or standing at the back of the vaulted interior. Its patron is Saint Anthony, a monk who is believed to have lived in rural Egypt in the 4th or 5th century. This place has been a shrine. This is not something new. Even before there was urban development and cars, Kozaya has always been a shrine. We don't even know when it started to be a shrine. Kozaya lies within a valley known as the Valley of Saints or Cunabin in ancient Syriac part of a wider valley network called Kadisha that has a long history as a refuge for monks. At one time, Kadisha was home to hundreds of hermitages churches, caves, and monasteries. The monastery of St. Anthony is the last surviving one. The inhabitants of this mountain from all sects, not just the Christians, they were weak. They came here because they were persecuted and weak. And they were not just Christians, they were Muslims too. They came to hide in the mountains, which had no roads like now and armies could only reach with difficulty. It was an early home for Lebanon's Christian Maronites, the first followers of the Roman Catholic Church in the East. The Maronites and sometimes the Jews, a Muslim sect, sought the sanctuary of the mountains away from the political and religious dynasties of the times with whom they did not always agree. The monastery is surrounded by forests of pine and cedar and orchards that can only be reached via a narrow winding road. <laughs> It is easier for us now to survive. It was not like before. At least now, no one is telling us they are coming to slaughter us anymore. We have guarantees, not just from the state, 
but from those who follow a faith different to ours. We have lots of guarantees, at least in Lebanon. Its grounds include a cave where visitors light candles, a museum housing the Middle East's oldest printing press in ancient Syriac and halls for resident priests. Visitors nowadays include foreign and Arab tourists and local residents, including Muslims who sometimes come to ask for a blessing. Before he left, Brotus and his fellows stood for a final photo outside the building with the valley behind. With their flags and scarves around their necks, they smiled and cheered as the bells rang. And the population of giraffes in Kenya is on the decline. Giraffe numbers across the continent fell 40% between 1985 and 2015 to just under 100,000 animals, according to figures available to the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Laikipia in central Kenya was once teeming with giraffes, but today it's becoming more difficult to spot them. Over the last 20 years, giraffe numbers have steadily declined in Kenya and across much of the African continent. The Samburu community has lived alongside giraffes for generations and killed the animal for food and medicine. We use uh, even the skin of the giraffe as some uh, medicines. They used to have to, to cook them, they burn them, and they, they, they have that gas. They, they scrub from the, the skin, then they use them as medicine. That's why sometimes why they used to kill them before. Northern Kenya is home to a subspecies of giraffe that is becoming increasingly rare. Current estimates show that the population of these reticulated giraffes has declined by over 60% in 20 years. Simon and his colleagues are animal researchers who monitor giraffe life and behavior. They collect data and help create conservation awareness among the communities that live around the animals. There has been so many research done on lions, uh, elephants and other species. But if you try to look at the giraffe, there's very little known about the giraffe. There's very little research done on the giraffe. Across the African continent, the number of giraffes decreased by around 40% between 1985 and 2015, to some 98,000 individuals. This population decrease has pushed six African nations to propose to regulate the international trade in giraffes. Animal activists argue that the effects of international trade on the giraffe population are unknown and a study should be carried out to assess the need for regulation. Let's see the extent of this trade, you know, first of all, let's determine is it local or is it also international or is it both? You know, what form does it take? Uh, you know, is it destructive to the overall population? You know, these are some of the questions that we need to answer before we can put in sort of uh, restrictive measures, in, in my view. The proposal would regulate the legal trade in giraffe parts obtained by trophy hunters in southern Africa. Observers are questioning the effectiveness of the measure, since most of the legal trade occurs in places where giraffe numbers are actually rebounding, like South Africa and Namibia, where game hunting is legal. You're still watching News World, you're on Newsroom Africa, Channel 405. After the break, we chat uh, women's economic empowerment in jewellery design. I'm joined in studio by Koketso Mohla, uh, Mohlala of uh, Ditsa, Ditsala Designs. Stay tuned. Welcome back to News World here on Newsroom Africa, Channel 405. Thank you for joining us as we connect you to the world. It's Women's Month, and this week we profile Koketso Mohlala, who is the founder of Detsala Design, handmade African jewelry made using material sourced from rural African suppliers. In 2015, Koketso received a scholarship to study in Italy, where she obtained her European Master's Diploma in Goldsmith Gemstone Design. Now, she supplies a number of international and local shops and employees and teaches women in Shoshanguva and Pretoria in South Africa, where her studio is situated, to make the jewels. Koketso, welcome to News World here on Newsroom Africa. Thank you for joining us. Firstly, before we begin, we begin, I must commend you on living your truth and doing something that seems uh, so far-fetched for most people, because this is one of the, I mean, I look at this beautiful item that you've created, and uh, it is something that people only dream of, but you have gone out and you have made your dreams become a reality. Uh, and while, uh, stalking you a little bit. There was something very beautiful that I read and I want to share it with our viewers and okay. I want you to expand more on this. Okay. 
th there was a girl who was tired of seeing Africans absorbing standards and trends that are set by Europeans, she said to herself. What is the point of multiculturalism if we all become one? Same ethics, same dress, same attitude, same way of thinking, same hair, same clothes and socialization. Where is the richness in that if Africa looks like Europe? I love that. What does multiculturalism mean to you? Um, as Koketo Mpo Moshala, I'm African. Mm. And fortunately, I got an opportunity to study in Europe. And when I went there, it was quite sad to see that Africa is actually becoming, it's becoming more like Europe. And then I said to myself, okay, so there's nothing unique about Europe. You know, everything that the TV is selling to us is just a dream, mm. you know. And the reason why I, I didn't feel anything unique, anything special about Europe is that it's because our continent is absorbing what they are selling to us. Mm. And then I said to myself, okay, I'm tired of seeing this. I'm, so, I'm tired of seeing Africans absorbing Euro European standards, European trends. American standards, American trends. I'm African, I wanna tell my story. I'm mm. tired of listening to other people. It's high time people listen to us because first of all, most of the things are, are actually come from Africa. Mm. It's just that they were stolen from us mm. and then they come to us as dreams. Mm -hmm. yes. So traveling the world, uh, particularly Italy is where you had your scholarship and you went to study jewelry design there. Uh, it's opened your, your eyes to the world and broadened your horizons. Uh, and yeah, it's, you know, and it, it also boils down also I think to a value thing, like you say, you know, uh, we on the continent absorb so much from what the West feeds us, is that you never actually look at uh, the beauty that's on the continent or take that seriously or think that it's of any value. I mean, for instance, uh, let's uh, take us through a story. You say you want to tell your story. You want to tell a story about the fact that you are from Africa, you are African, this is in your blood, um, and you're using jewelry to tell the story. Yes. So, for instance, this, this piece that I'm holding, man, I'm drawn to this. Tell us the story behind this. Um, I believe that every woman is a, is a queen. Mm -hmm. So, and then every time I, 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 I open a magazine or I browse through the net, I mm -hmm. see the same thing. Mm -hmm. I don't see Africa. I see diamonds. Mm -hmm. I see sparkles mm -hmm. everywhere. And then I said to myself, okay, why, why can't I do something with Africa? Why can't we feel beautiful embracing our culture? Mm. And then I said, okay, let me start making African crowns. Cause the first time I made one, I even Googled African crowns. And surprisingly, I didn't find anything. And that was quite sad. And, the, and then I said, okay, let me start making African crowns. And now they are actually trending. Mm. And I feel honored because I'm celebrated because of them. I'm attracting international buyers because of these crowns. And now other designers are even copying me. So That's it beautiful. means I'm a trendsetter. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, Kuketsu, let's talk about some of your international buyers. I mean, obviously, that's why I, I must commend you because you have done managed to pull off uh, something so wonderful and something so amazing here. You are exposed to a global market. Obviously, you had studied in Italy, uh, and uh, I'm sure you must have used that opportunity to uh, really put yourself out there. But not only that, your work speaks for itself. You're selling to a global market. Who are these buyers that are interested in buying these crowds? Um, where do you sell your stuff? <laughs> I sell them on Instagram and mm -hmm. Facebook. Mm -hmm. Instagram and Facebook are very powerful tools for, mm -hmm. for, for a very small business like mine. Mm -hmm. Um, I attracted um, a, a big um, retailer in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, it's Ceci Jones. And ever since she started buying from Dizala Designs, like we've grown, I've employed more people. I've mm -hmm. even opened my own jewelry studio. Mm -hmm. And now we're also attracting other fashion retailers. But then the sad thing is that in South Africa, I don't really have a big market, and that is quite sad because I should be celebrated here at home mm -hmm. before going global, but then I'm going global so that I can be recognized here. Why do you think that's the case, that you're, being, you're, you're having to go global, and only now suddenly when you make it big do people back home now take you seriously or support your business? Why do you think that that's the case? 
Do you think it's just a mindset? Uh, and like, maybe it could perhaps go back to this when you had said earlier uh, that, uh, you know, as uh, we tend to, we're so Europeanized, Europeanized, or, you know, we're Eurocentric, or we're so influenced by the West that we don't take our, our own gems seriously, and we don't support our own things, and we don't believe enough in our culture and our style. And maybe because we're so heavily influenced by other cultures, do you think that that maybe perhaps plays a role in this? It plays a big role. Mm -hmm. It does. It does, actually. And it's quite sad because all these materi the, the materials we're using, they're actually mined in Africa. Wow. Yes. Okay, that. tell us more about that. How do you uh, go about sourcing your materials? I, I buy my materials here in South Africa because... Mm -hmm. They are mined here in South Africa. I don't export anything. I don't import anything, I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and this is obviously done on purpose. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want my, my products to be 100% South African mm -hmm. or 100% Afri African. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I don't go online and say, okay, I'm going to buy beads from China. No. We've got beads in South Africa. If they're expensive, it's fine. Customers are willing to pay. So I will buy the real thing. Mm -hmm. I won't buy anything cheap. Mm -hmm just to, to say, okay, I want to cut costs. Because mm -hmm. if I'm buying from South Africa, it means I'm supporting the other economy. businesses, you know? Mm -hmm. So we can, I don't just make it. It's a whole cycle of women empowering each other. Mm. If I grow, we grow together. Mm. We're gonna talk about your women empowerment projects as well, but before we get there, while we're on the topic of the materials that you're buying from the continent, you know, uh, you're saying you'd rather buy it here even though it's more expensive as opposed to getting it from China or other places that would be cheaper. Do you find that it's a lot more expensive to, to support uh, local products or local raw materials? Yes, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's okay. very expensive and Honestly, that's why many jewelers don't make it in the industry because mm -hmm. accessing raw materials mm -hmm. is the biggest problem. So you think you need assistance uh, in that sort of way as well with your business? Yes. Because, mm -hmm. yes, yes, I mean, it must have been a very hard... Uh, this project that you've embarked on has been an ambitious project. Like I said, it's, a, it's not the easiest thing to begin with, you know? Uh, and you've managed to do something, and you've also managed to pay it forward. You mentioned uh, women empowerment, and your studios are based in Pretoria, Shoshanguve. Yes, yes. Uh, and this is where you have a, uh, a studio where you teach women how no, to... No, I don't teach. Okay, so tell us about the studio and what happens then. You're also employing women. Um, what I do is I, I'm, I'm working with people who also went to jewelry projects, people mm -hmm. who, that, who couldn't afford to go to varsity. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with them, and then... Through me, they also learn skills that they didn't know before because mm -hmm. I'm more qualified. And then, obviously, through experience, you, 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 also, you also grow as a person. Mm -hmm. Like, even my assistant, she's going to China next week to do... Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> my, yes, yes, yes. Okay, Carrie, she's going to China too? She's going to China through um, the TPI and... Um, DTI. So she's going to do more training. She, she's a qualified jeweler, but then she only has level three. So now she's going to get more training in China. Oh. Lovely. Okay, so it seems that there is, there is a, some sort of platform being provided to women in the jewelry design industry. Uh, but then, Koketa, let's talk about the studio in Shoshanguve. What happens there? You say you, you, you share skills. So you're not teaching, but you're sharing skills and you're employing women. Tell us what exactly happens in the studio. How are you paying it forward to other women? How are you empowering other women? Um, I can't say I'm teaching because mm -hmm. they are working. I'm paying salaries. Yes. Well done on that. You're creating employment. You are, uh, what you're doing there is that you are contributing towards women's economic empowerment. And that is a beautiful thing and it's something that you should be very proud of. Thank you. So you employ them? Um, so basically what we do is if I have more orders, mm. I, I, I hire a team of girls and boys. We mm. work together because... Mm. For now, I can afford to say, okay, you guys are working with me full time. Mm, okay. So they work with me part time. They only yes. work with me when we have bulk orders. Mm. And then I also outsource to, to other projects because mm -hmm. I don't want only the designs to benefit. There are also mm. small businesses that I, I also give small projects to because I believe that if I had the kind of support that I'm giving other small businesses, mm -hmm. now I would be very far. So if I get a bulk order, I call other small businesses to help me so that mm. we can all get something. All right. Yeah. I mean, uh, and you know what, what you just said there right now is something very important because what you just described is a supply chain. Yes. And you're con contributing to the supply chain of jewelry design. I mean, it is, it, it is fascinating and it's something that you must not take lightly. I also wanted to ask you about 
how does jewelry, uh, okay, the jewelry that the Tala Designs make, is it specifically for women or do you also specialize in men's jewelry as well? Let me drink water on that. All right, okay, cool. So um, how does jewelry affect women, do you think? Like emotionally, professionally, personally, like you are wearing a beautiful ring on your hand. Um, you're wearing some beautiful earrings, but you're not just putting them on for the sake of putting it on. You've, put, you've given thought uh, into putting that. So how does jewelry, do you think, affect, affect women in this day? Um, it complements your outfit. Mm -hmm. But then with Dizala's jewelry, it doesn't complement your, your outfit only. It also tells a story of who you are, what you love, mm -hmm. and where you're going as okay. a person. Okay. Yes. It tells a story about who you are, what you love, and where you're going. For me, I mean, I love jewelry, and I know you don't do diamonds, but there's that saying, and not just on chauvinistic, diamonds are a girl's best friend. I mean, yeah. the relationship that a woman has with jewelry is very important. I think a relationship that most people have with jewelry is, is pretty important because, uh, in a way, it is a, it's kind of a, it's, it's a symbolism of achievement, you know, whether it's financial success, uh, whether it is uh, finding someone that you love and you want to spend the rest of your life with, they give you a ring, you get married, yeah. you may pass this ring down to generations. Uh, and then, you know, for me, for instance, a piece of jewelry is a, is a symbol of success. Uh, do you think that uh, jewelry uh, makes people feel good? Yes, it does. Yeah. It does. Uh, it's even important. Me, like, it's, it's very important because yeah. I can't go out without a pair of earrings. Yes. Even sometimes, even when I go to sleep, I wear maybe tiny ones so that yeah. I can be comfortable. Yes. But then, like, I feel like every woman should wear jewelry. Mm. Yeah. All right. And then uh, also, uh, Koketso, you had a sip of uh, your water when I asked you the question about men's jewelry. Tell us, wh why were you hesitant there? Is there not a market for that? Have you, wh what's going on? What's the story behind that? There is a market for men's mm. jewelry, but then with us, the women buy for their men. So we do mm. have a, a men's range, mm. but then it's not doing that well. But then okay. obviously on Father's Day, you know, people come to us, okay, I want something for my boyfriend, I want something for my colleague. And then we make maybe cufflinks, we make mm. little pendants. But then you also know that men are stingy when it comes to, to accessorizing and all that. Okay. They don't, a man can just go and say, okay, I'm going to buy a brooch. Okay. Yeah. Did and you buy that one? Uh, yes, I did. Oh. Uh, I did hear that you make men's brooches, by the yes. way. So you and I will have a little chat after the show as well. Uh, Kuketsu Mahlala, thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening. We commend you. We congratulate you on the wonderful uh, opportunities you've created for women. You've contributed to empowering women economically. Uh, you are paying it forward. You are sharing your skills. That's what Detala Designs is all about. And we wish you all the best for your business. Uh, that is uh, Koketso Motlala joining us live uh, here on Newsworld on Newsroom Africa, Channel 405. Uh, thank you for staying tuned. Newsworld continues after a short break.